I think it's raining cats and dogs out here. I just stepped in a poodle. I've been waiting 20 minutes to tell that joke. Pastor Mike here, and I'm online, and I'm live with you today, and we've got thunderstorms going right over our head today. Um, some I don't think they're worried about any um, tornadoes or anything like that, but hail, damaging hail and high winds, and my favorite thing in the world, electricity, shooting down out of the skies like the vengeance of Almighty God. And uh, I just don't want any part of it. So you see me looking back here. I'm looking at the um, the local radar and just kind of keeping my eye on things here. Anyway, good to be with you today. Um, I want to start out with a couple of things very quickly. A couple of prayer items. Bethel member Linda Toomey, um, I have um, tweeted prayer requests about her several times before. She uh, suffers from a lot of ailments, one of which is her heart. And um, she, let's see, what year was it? It was uh, almost two years ago. She, um, she died. She died in her house. And her husband, boy, you just, they, they have a wonderful testimony. Her husband went to her in the middle of the night, found her there, started doing CPR, and he's telling God, I want to keep my wife. I want to keep my wife. And the ambulance came, took her to the hospital. Um, they called, with Lisa and I were on vacation, um, and they called us and, and said, you know, that she is in the hospital. Well, when we came back, it was on a uh, Sunday morning, we were headed toward the um, um, ICU and expecting the worst. And as we're walking toward the ICU entrance door, they're wheeling her out on a wheelchair, sitting up, smiling at everybody. And it just absolutely, I was stunned. My jaw dropped open. Tears came to my eyes. And what a, what a blessing that was. But anyway, now Linda calls and says that it's her husband. And I don't know if you were watching our church service Sunday morning, but she had mentioned that as a prayer. No, she didn't. She told me about it on the way out. She said to pray for her husband, David. And, um, and so I, as he was walking out, I put my arm around him. David, I love you. I'm going to pray for you. Well, anyway, he's in the hospital. She put him in the hospital uh, here locally. Um, they're looking at his heart and some other things. They're look, there's, there's all kinds of chemicals in the blood that are not normal. And so she wants us to pray uh, for him and pray for that family. It's a good family. They've, they've been good people in our church, and we love them to death. Um, anyway, and then uh, continue your prayers for those who are listening in Kenya, KBTR, Watchman FM 91.3 in Samburu County. Um, a lot of violence going over there, and it's not Muslim-related. And I, they're listening right now live. It's about 8 p.m. over there or something like that. Um, but anyway, my encouragement to everybody who listens to this radio station, listens to this broadcast in Kenya, your real enemies are north. I mentioned this last week. Your real enemies are north of you. It is the Muslim terrorists that keep coming into your country, and they are very, very dangerous. They're very deadly. They are full of devils. And some would say, well, we need to witness to them and preach to them. Not while they're bent on cutting your head off. Now, maybe God will do a miracle. I'm, I'm not saying he won't. But what I'm telling you is, quit killing each other and work together to make sure that your, that your county, your country, your homes in that area remain safe and secure from the enemy that lies to the north of you in Somalia. They're, they'll be coming back down again. Um, Islam is right now in a vengeance mode. I don't know if that's called a vengeance mode. Is, I'll put it like this. Islam right now is experiencing a great and mighty evangelism effort. 
They're trying to reach out to as many people as possible to convert them to Islam, or they'll slit your throat and cut your head off, rape your wives and your children. That's what they'll do. They'll take your five-year-old daughters and make wives out of them, make little slaves out of them. That's, that's, who, that's who you need to worry about. And um, uh, just the Bible, the Bible tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. Those of you in that area, your neighbor is not supposed to be the guy that you hate, that you want to kill all the time. I don't care if he did take your goat. I don't, I don't care if he is taking water out of your well. It doesn't matter. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think, go read the story of the Good Samaritan, and you'll, maybe God will give you some understanding on that. And so anyway, a lot of people have, have, have asked and uh, had concern about it. I'm concerned about it because I want the gospel preached up there, and I want people to be able to hear it freely. And if Islam and if those Muslim terrorists succeed in taking over that part of Kenya, they'll shut our radio station down. <laughs> they may leave the Catholic one on, but they'll shut ours down. And so anyway, just be in prayer for that, and I appreciate all the prayers that everybody has sent in so far. Um, I'm going to start out today. I've got, I don't know, 27 different articles, all of them related to uh, technology or DNA, transhumanism, things like that. Uh, let me just see here if there's one that is really, really germane here. That doesn't mean German. Um, there's, a, there's a computer called The Beast. You guys have been sending me some pretty good stuff here, and I'm saving them in my, in my oh, here, here's one. Here's one. I am going to deal with this one right now, and I'll save the other ones for later. I am going to be in Harrison, Arkansas, Thursday afternoon. There will not be a Pastor Mike Online live broadcast on Thor's Day. Uh, we'll be headed to Harrison, Arkansas, Saturday morning, um, if God permits. I, you remember Sunday, I've been asking the Lord, God, what do you want me to preach down in Harrison? I've got two hours on Saturday morning down there. What do you want me to preach? And God gave me something, uh, let's see here, Sunday night. And I, I, I'm just, I can't wait to get, I don't even have the uh, the PowerPoint's done. I don't have the uh, the script done for it. I don't have my notes done, and I'm still finding things out as I'm putting this together. That's what I, that's the kind of stuff I like. Is to start out with an idea, and when I start researching it to put it together, I find out stuff I never would have thought of before. And that's that's what's coming uh, this Saturday. We are going to record that. We'll release it once we get it edited and things like that. But I'm telling you, you, you have got to listen to this one, all right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an update on DNA. I've been reading a book about DNA in the human cell, and I'm, I'm floored right now over some things that I know. And if you love the Lord and you love his word, and you don't believe that we came from monkeys, you'll cry, you'll shout, the doodads will go up and down your back. I'm just, I'm very excited to to get into this. This is an old story. Uh, Drudge Report uh, focused on it today, and it comes out in the Independent, which I think is, uh, yeah, it's a British, independent.co.uk. And uh, it's called The Lost Tomb of Jesus? Question mark. Scientist claims he has virtually unequivocal evidence that could help explain the whereabouts of Christ's remains. I know where they are. I know, I know where they are. They don't remain here. Okay? They don't. God, God, and here's how you can know that the remains of Jesus are not going to be discovered in some cave somewhere, or any place for that matter. The Bible said even before Christ came on the scene that God would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. Was not going to The two days that Jesus laid in that tomb, he didn't stink. There were no flies trying to get in there. He had not, his fingers hadn't, hair hadn't dropped off. None of that happened. The state that his body was in when it laid in that tomb it remained exactly that way. Now, here's what I like. 
it late, did that for two days. The day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Here you have two days, and God did not allow his Holy One to see corruption. Get ready, get ready. It's been 2,000 years, and God has not allowed his Holy One to see corruption. Can I hear you say amen? But anyway, um, th this, this is an old story. I don't know why they're coming out with it now, but it's an old story. This guy, and I don't know if you, uh, when I saw it, I remembered that symbol. This guy found this tomb with this all-seeing eye capstone insignia above it. And he's going, dun, 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 that's Jesus. A geologist in Jerusalem claims to have found virtually unequivocal evidence that could reopen the controversy over the final resting place of Jesus Christ. Dr. Arya Shimron says he has carried out new tests that suggest it is more likely the Talpiot tomb, a burial site found in East Jerusalem, in 1980, was a family grave for Jesus of Nazareth, his wife Mary Magdalene, and his son Judah. This is a setup, people. That's what this is. It's a setup. Here, here is this article going out all over the world, and your lost family members, you've been trying to tell them about crop circles and, um, and uh, chemtrails and everything else, and then you tell them, uh, you need to trust in Jesus. He's real. And then they read stuff like this, and they say, oh, really? Well, they just found his rotted carcass inside of an, a tomb in Jerusalem. Here's the proof right here. How are you going to combat that? Uh, and people are going to latch on to this stuff. You know why? They don't want to believe that God is real, because if they believe that God is real, then they understand that they broke his law, and they know what's coming. So they're not going to believe that God's real. Um, dubbed The Lost Tomb of Jesus in a 2007 documentary movie directed by James Cameron, the chamber contained nine burial boxes or ossuaries inscribed with the names Jesus, son of Joseph, Mary, and other names associated with the New Testament. The inscriptions and the approximate dates of burial have led some to suggest the Talpiot tomb remains or means Jesus married, that he fathered a child, and that the existence of bodily remains means the resurrection could never have happened. That's the goal right here. That's, that's what this is about. Because the devil thought that he had victory over Christ when Jesus died on the cross. He then must have realized that he lost because Christ rose from the dead. I'm just going to talk about a couple issues on this thing very quickly. Number one, read your Bible and believe it. Read every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the crucifixion, the death of Read the burial, read the resurrection of Jesus Christ in all four Gospels and say, God, I believe your newspaper over this newspaper every day and twice on Sundays. That's what you do. Number two, if Jesus married Mary, if Jesus merrily married Mary, then that disqualifies him from being the bishop of our souls. Because the qualifications of a bishop is he's to be the husband of one wife. If he married Mary Magdalene, merrily, and then he intends to marry us, the church, he's disqualified from being bishop. He cannot be our bishop. You understand that? That's what the Scripture says. Two places, once in, I think, Colossians and one in Timothy. The qualifications for a bishop are given. It needs to be the husband of one wife. He's to rule his family well. And Christ is the bishop of our souls, and he loses the job if he has more than one wife, if he has two wives. And there's just, there is so many difficulties with this thing. Uh, it's not even funny. But here, here, I want you to get this. I've been telling you, and I think the Bible tells you this too. The Bible tells it better than I do. You may have heard it from some other people too who believe the Bible. In 2 Thessalonians 2, we know that um, the Bible talks about our gathering together unto him, that the falling away takes place 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th. No, 1st. The falling away takes place first, and that man of sin revealed the son of perdition. Then it goes on to talk about um, let's see here, verse, 
let's see. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. There's your, there's your clue right here, Sherlock. All deceivableness. Let's dig up, quote, unquote, evidence of Jesus remains being in a tomb. Let's present that to the world. Let's get everybody in the world to believe that Jesus Christ is still dead. And if he's still dead right now, he's not the mediator between us and God. He is not carrying our prayers. He is not our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is none of those things. We, ha we have no faith. We have no hope if that body of Jesus is still in the tomb and it corrupted, we have no hope. Jesus is the Word, and if the Word corrupted, we have no hope. Um, oh, man, I keep, I keep wanting to kind of share with you what I'm going to be talking about Saturday. I keep wanting to just bleh, spill it, uh, and, and it would take too long. It's, I'm developing the thoughts and putting it together so it makes sense. No, I'll, I'll wait. Anyway, um, he says here, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, well, listen to this now, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. The love of the truth is what exactly what the Bible says about Jesus. He died. He was crucified, buried. He is risen. He ascended to the Father. He is coming again. Those are great and precious promises that we believe. This is what our faith stands on. Our faith stands on the word, not the words of men, but the word of God. And I'll be honest with you. I think you're going to hear it, it, this. Like, again, this article's been around since 2007. They did a documentary on this thing. James Cameron did. He see, James Cameron, the free may said, Yeah! And people are going to believe it. And they want to believe it because they don't want the truth. The truth is they are guilty before Almighty God. James Cameron and all these people, they, be, they actually believe this stuff. And they would not receive the love of the truth. And because of that, for this reason alone, God, he said in verse 11, and for this cause... God, there's that word cause again. Remember what the false prophet does in Revelation 13, 11? No, see, it's not 13, 11. It's 13, I don't know, 16, 17, somewhere in there. But he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, six groups of people. He causes all six of those groups to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead causes them. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, what I think that this article here, this nonsense about Jesus and his old lady, Mary Magdalene, and their little brat kid, Judah, being buried in this, in this tomb, people are believing that because that's a partial fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians 2. God is turning people over to believe this stuff. That he's making them drunk. He's using Babylon and that cup of Babylon to pour false doctrine and false ideas out to people who don't want to know the truth. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about n believing that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God. They care nothing about it. They want to believe. And here's what I think is going to happen. I think that there's going to be religious scholars, Christian scholars from liberal universities or whatever who are going to say, you know, it really doesn't matter to us whether Jesus' body is still in the tomb or it's in heaven. We still believe that God loves everybody, don't we? And they're going to come up with this saying that says it doesn't matter. You learn this when you go to Bible college, which I you don't need to go to Bible college, but this is the kind of stuff you learn. You learn some of these weird ideas that people have. German liberal scholars and things like that come up with stuff like, 
it's not important whether or not Jesus actually lived. It's only important that we believe that he lived. And I'm just, I've, I heard that 30 years ago, and I am still trying to figure out what in the stink that means. I have no idea what that means. It's not important now whether Jesus lived or not. It's only important that we believe. Let's, let's take that now. Let's take Jesus out of that equation. And let's put Santa Claus. It's not important whether or not Santa Claus really lives and exists. It's only important that we believe that he exists. See? It doesn't make it any more real, does it? Mom and dad still have to go and buy the presents and wrap them and put them under the tree. Anyway, this old news, they're going to keep regurgitating it, make it out. That, that's what Dan, Brand's, Dan Brown's whole premise in the uh, Da Vinci Code was, was that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He uh, was drugged and survived it, made it look, faked his death, and then he had uh, Mary Magdalene revive him again, and he gave her a baby, and yeah, there's this bloodline of Jesus running around. Uh, anyway, um, let, me, let me read, I've got an email here, and I'm going to use that. I'm still dealing with, we're still going to be talking about the Bible translation issue. And how we got our Bible. And can we actually believe that a Bible that we could hold in our hand is inerrant, has no mistakes in it? And I'll, I'll boy, again, I, I want to keep talking about what I'm going to talk about Saturday, but let me just, let me just say this. You better thank God Almighty that God knows how to both copy his word, because that's what the scribes did in the Old Testament days. This is what the church people did in the New Testament times. They took those original manuscripts and they copied them. Did they copy them correctly? Yes. You better thank God that God knows how to make a perfect copy from an original to a new place. You better thank God that he knows how to do that. And God, and listen to me, God does it billions and billions, I maybe even trillions of times every, I was going to say every day, but I, I think it's every hour or maybe every minute. I'm, and I'm, I absolutely mean what, I'm not exaggerating. God copies his word, I would say, into the trillions of times every hour all over this planet. Okay? If I got you going, what are you talking about, Pastor Mike? And, I, and I'll give you another one, too. Not only does God copy his word correctly and perfectly trillions of times every hour all over this planet, God also translates that word trillions of times every hour all over the world. He does this every single hour. He rests not day and night, translating his word correctly all over the planet. Trillions of times every hour. Where do, you, where do you find out what I'm talking about? I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe is what I am. Let me check my radar here. Let's see, there's Festus. And let's see here. All the radars forming. We're getting, receiving the transmission of data in. It's drawing it on the screen. And let's see here. Do we have rain outside? I have no windows in this room, by the way, so I have no idea of knowing. I think we might be in the clear for now. 
Here is an email that came in, and uh, let me just check real quick because it just it came in. Um, let's see, blah 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 blah. No, um, this is I won't give his name, uh, but I I think he wouldn't mind me sharing his story with you, um, because it's going to sound familiar to some of you people. All right. Um, let's just say this guy's name is, um, oh, I don't know, Bill. We'll call him Bill, all right? Uh, Good morning, Pastor Mike. Over the past few months, I've been drawn close to the Lord after some medical issues in my life. Boy, isn't that, uh, go read Psalm 119 again, people. Remember, I, remember what I told you last week? If you ever get in doubt because some lunatic tried to convince you that the King James has got mistakes in it, it's a terrible translation, you need to come over to the dark side of the Message Bible. And that's bothering you, and it's vexing you. Now, I'll show you what that means in a minute. If that's, if that's ever happened to you, I told you to read Psalm 119 from beginning to the end. And when you get done, you'll be convinced, or you should be convinced, that your Bible is right in everything that it says. And part of that is where, where David was talking about, um, I, can't, I can't think of it right now, but he's talking about having infirmities in his flesh and problems and ailments and things like that. Because, what, yeah, here it is. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. That's what this guy is saying. Bill. He said, I have been a Christian for 30 years, had over the uh, last several the Lord, uh, he said, uh, but over the last several, the Lord has been cutting away at areas of my life. You know what that? You know what that is biblically. That is the husbandman who is pruning the vine. God has an interest in you, in you producing or bearing fruit that glorifies God. The fruit of the believer being manifested in a believer's life is what is this, That's what God is looking for what God is hoping for. He is the husbandman who sows in tears and reaps in joy. That's what he is. And when God looks at your life and he says, there are some things here that you don't need. In fact, as long as you have them in your life, they're going to hurt you. So I'm going to take them away. I'm going to cut them off. And listen, people, sometimes we question why we end up in the circumstances we end up with, why people died that we cared about. Sometimes we question why we lost this job over here, or we had to move over here, or, or why our neighbor won't let us talk to him anymore. And we, we don't, God, I don't understand that. Or, or maybe you just, God allowed you to be an offense to someone, and now they're just going to stay clear from you. And you're wondering, God, God, I want them back in my life. And God was saying, no, no, uh-uh. No, I, listen, I understand how you feel, but I'm telling you, the greater good is that I took these things or these people or this stuff out of your life because it was going to, it was either hindering your growth or it was going to hinder your growth. And I'm the one who knows that. Some of you ask why you don't have more money than what you have, why it's been a struggle for you financially to just get by. And you're, you're like, I'm going to buy lottery tickets. I'm going to buy lottery tickets, and I'm going to win the, the lottery, and I'm going to have $200 million, and boy, then I'll have no problems after that. Are you kidding me? Go read James about rich people and their problems. God won't let you win that. Why? God knows. God knows why. God knows what you would turn out to be having $200 million in your pocket. He's very, listen, he's very wise. You ought to learn to trust him. But you know, and I'm, I'm not preaching down my nose at you. I'm this way. God takes stuff out of my life and I just cry and moan and whine and carry on and everything like that. But anyway, let me get to the email. He said, I'm not ashamed, to, uh, let me see, be cut away areas of my life uh, which are not in line with his word. I'm always strongly convicted that when I am not in the fold and have strayed, I'm not ashamed to say that he has had me on my face in tears of repentance. Amen. I love him very much, and I want to make sure I spend eternity in heaven with him. I am working out my salvation 
daily, and I know I am secure in the Lord. Nothing wrong with what he just said. The Bible says, work out your own salvation. I've got to refresh this screen here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That does not mean we have works for salvation. It just means that your relationship with God and your salvation is not my responsibility. It's not your mother and father's responsibility. It's not the church's overall responsibility. It's not that person that you're mad at. It's not their responsibility. It's yours. You're the one that's going to have to decide where you're going to spend eternity. So anyway, here's what he said. Recently, I changed over to the KJV from the NIV because of the inconsistencies I keep seeing in the translation. I am also alarmed at the terrible translations which are being produced today by what used to be credible translators. It's kind of going downhill, isn't it? Uh, My wife and I joined a blank, blank, blank church in blank Canada. I'll say he's, he's from Canada. That's what it says. Bill from Canada, eh? And I've made an effort to faithful members and um, and to support the church. I have in the past, and again recently, used tongues in my own prayer life. However, when I do, I have not been very comfortable, and I have felt the Holy Spirit pushing me to question this and to seek the truth from the Word on this matter. That's all I want anybody to do. That's all I care about, is to do what God said to do to begin with. Test the spirits. And some of you have been told by the prophet that came to visit your church, the prophet told you, don't question God. You have to accept this as being his will for your life don't question that now, because that's good. Because if you question it and you doubt it, you won't get it. That's God right there. You won't. If you doubt it, you won't get it at, at all. That's why. That's why all you Baptists out there don't speak in tongues like us, because you don't believe in it. And they they'll tell you that. I've I've heard them tell people, "Don't question us. We are prophets. We are in authority." We can say what we want to say, and you have to do what we tell you to do. You have to obey God's prophets. And if you dare stand up with a Bible in your hand and say, um, you're telling all these women to come forward and, and display their gift of tongues, but it says right here in First Corinthians, that wasn't written for us, and God has given us new revelations now. That's what they say. Um, anyway, he says, um, I'm seeking the truth from the word on this matter. I've ceased attempting to use tongues uh, and even asked the Lord to forgive me if this was not from him. I believe that the Bible is 100% the word of God, infallible, and the final authority on all things. Woo-hoo! Um, I believe that any manifestation of the true Holy Spirit will be consistent with the word of God. Correct. I recently watched a video on tongues, and I'm currently studying this gift. That's what I, you're doing. You don't. I'm glad he didn't say, I watched your video, and I'm going to do what you told me to do. No, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want it. God doesn't want it. And trust me, you don't want it either. Because if I can talk you out of something, somebody else can come along and talk you into something. But when you decide that you're going to listen to God and God alone, on any subject. Once he establishes something in your heart, there ain't a man in the world that can take it away. I don't have to examine the evidence that was found in this tomb in East Jerusalem that they say is Jesus from Nazareth and his wife, Mary Magdalene, and their kid, Judah. I don't have to examine that evidence to try to find fault with it. I don't need it. I don't believe it. At its face, I don't believe it. Why? Because God has put a very profound yet simple truth inside of my heart, and I don't deviate from that. I can't deviate from that. I'm chained to it. It is that Christ died and he rose again so that, and so that you and I could live with him forever in Christ. We are, Romans 6, we're buried with him by baptism, that like as he was raised, so we walk in a newness of life. 
And that's established in our hearts. And we read this story and you're going, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Who, I don't know who in their right mind would ever believe something, some kind of nonsense like this, that they found Jesus' dead body in a, in a hole somewhere, in a box. I don't know where they get these people. I don't know where these people get their education. But I don't, and I don't know what Bible they read, but the Bible I say rose, 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 from, the, rose from the dead. You see how that's, that's what you do. And no man can take that away. Um, anyway, he said, I am also concerned and feel uncomfortable when some women in our church bust out in tongues in the middle of the service with a, quote, message from the Lord. This is usually followed by interpretation by both male and female members of the congregation. I must admit that I sometimes feel uncomfortable in my spirit about some of the things I hear, like using teachings from Rick Warren or read a book by Joyce Myers. This is what he's being told to do in his church. It is making me question if I want to remain in this church. I love the Lord with all my heart, and I want to be faithful in him and to serve him alone. I'm writing to you because I frankly know his name is not Frank, by the way. Can I be frank with you? You can be whoever you want. Uh, because I frankly don't know where to turn. I'm well-versed in the Bible and can defend many positions. I believe sound doctrine is essential to good and victorious Christian living. I want to make sure that I'm following the true Lord and Savior and being led by the Holy Spirit. I am a reader of such ministers as Barnhouse and Missler, Chuck, uh, this may give uh, some insight into my theology. I hope that you could let me know your thoughts on this issue. I apologize this is a burden, as I'm sure you are swamped with similar requests to thank uh, you and the Lord for your ministry. Uh, and, Andrew, God, God allowed me to see your email and, and deal with it at, right at the top of the broadcast here. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. You're asking about what direction you should take. You're in a church where all of this stuff is going on. And from what I'm reading in your email, you, I believe you are. I believe you're well-grounded. I believe you have the idea that if God said it, that settles it. It's over with. I'm not going to argue with God, even though if I don't understand everything in here, this is what he said, and to me it's, it's over and done with. And I, I think you're right on target may never meet you in this world. I think I'll meet you in heaven. Here's the problem. Here's the issue. Um, let's say, I'm, it doesn't say here, but I'm assuming you're a family man. Wife, children. Yeah, it says my wife and I joined this such and such church. She may not be that strong. She may not be that grounded. She is going to be relying upon her husband, like the scripture says. Or you have children, where you, and during Sunday school, where do the children go? Do they sit by mom and dad? No, they go to the Sunday school class, which nowadays is a, it's a big party with little or no scripture being given. They teach them all these little fuzzy, furry, little philosophy ideas, self, um, uh, self-awareness, self, um, self-esteem stuff paradigm shifting nonsense and then rock and roll and the thing is there is an issue that you see in the bible called vexation and what that is you'll have you'll have a concept or an idea it's it's let me explain it like this have you ever had somebody call your cell phone and you pulled your cell phone out looked at the number and you're going i don't want to talk to these people or I don't want to talk to her right now. <laughs> it's your mom <laughs> or your wife. And you're looking at that going, I ain't talking to her. So you don't answer it. 20 seconds later, calls back. I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. So you don't even, don't even answer it. Two minutes later, calls again. I said, I'm not calling you. I'm not going to talk to you. Three minutes later, what do you want? You know what happened? You just got to where you just, you, you couldn't take it. You gave in. And we're all prone to do it somehow, some way. That's what vexation is. The Bible talks about Lot, righteous, just Lot, being vexed with the iniquities that were around him in Sodom. They were working on him day and night. And he got out of there by the skin of his nose, he got out of there. 
with his two daughters. But the vexation had already had such an impact upon him and his family. What, wh- where did his wife go? Why wasn't his wife with him when his daughters slept with him? The vexation worked on his wife. Let me, let me read a, uh, there's a verse here, and I've used this in some studies. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Um, this is where you get a, sort of an understanding of what the purpose of the devil vexing you. In um, Isaiah 7, 5, the Bible says, uh, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah, one, two, les trois, three. Three things um, have taken evil counsel against thee. That is a conspiracy right there. You just saw it in the Bible. Three people getting together, Syria, Ephraim, the son of Remaliah, Think of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those three. And there is an evil, evil agenda against you and against your family and against your wife, against your children, against your well-being, against your country, against my country. There is an agenda to vex America with so much sodomy, illegal, immigration, fornication, um, all kinds of filth through all kinds of media. There is an agenda to fundamentally transform America and bring her down by way of that vexation. At one point, America was established on the Word of God and the principles and the foundations of constitutional law. The Constitution was final. The Constitution was king. But the goal is to vex America to such an extent that America picks up the phone. We finally give in. And I'll tell you something, if you haven't seen it in the last six years of Barack Hussein being president in this nation, you know what I think? I think the last two years of his presidency are going to be, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because I know I've got little time. They always talk about a lame duck president which basically means that between the time that um, he lost the election to the time of the inauguration of the new president, there's not really a whole lot he can do. Let me tell you about this president. This president has already set a precedent for himself. Not a president, a precedent. (laughs) Some of you don't understand English that well, you're going, I have no idea what he's saying, man. He has already established a method of operation, a modus operandi, that says, I don't care what Congress will vote yes or no on. I don't care what the Supreme Court might do if I uh, issue an executive order. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want with my pen and my paperwork, and I dare you to stop me. And so far, no one has. That's vexation, people. And it's getting us so used to um, accepting things that we would have never accepted. Sodomite marriage, going to be accepted. It's going to be accepted. It's going to be accepted in every state of the union, and the churches are already doing it. But here, let's go back to Isaiah. He said, let us, he said, uh, they've taken evil counsel. He said, let us go up against Judah and vex it. And make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. There's your conspiracy right there. We're going to go up against Judah. Judah always represents God's people. We're going to go up against Judah. We're going to vex Judah. You know what that means? We're going to keep knocking on the door. We're going to keep knocking on the door until you open it or... We're going to keep hitting a weak spot in the wall until we break through. And once we get in, 
we're going to take our king and we're going to put him over you. And he's going to rule over you. And so, um, and I, I made a mistake. I accidentally read the guy's name, first name. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If it was my wife and children, I'd sit down and talk to him and say, look, here's what the Bible says. What they're doing is wrong. And I don't know about you guys, but I can't sit there while I see this stuff going on. It's, it's vexing me. It's bothering me. I'm going to have to do something at some point. I may, ha- I may just stand up on the pew in the middle of the church service and rebuke all of those mouthy women who are talking that nonsense in front of the in front of the congregation where they should be according to scripture sitting next to their husbands with their mouths shut and and at some point I may just have to jump up and say that's wrong I rebuke this in Jesus name and they'll throw me out and so I encourage you and your family to seek the Lord on this to pray about this but I think at some point they're going to vex you so much, that, or your wife and your children. There'll be a church split in your home. Okay? I'd hate to say that. I already have people that follow our ministry. There is a church split in their home. Wife sees it one way, husband sees it another. Wife watches Pastor Mike, Bethel Church, husband, don't anything to do with it. Can't stand that idiot, hoggard. Besides that, I've seen videos where people were exposing him as a as a heretic. <laughs> Did you see what I, I posted this on uh, my Facebook page? Uh, we're going to get our Bibles out, by the way. I posted this on my Facebook page. There's I've never mentioned his name publicly up until now, but there's this guy in, that came out of Chicago named Martin Richling, and this guy is un, it's just unreal, unbelievable. Um. He was a former Chicago cop, and we have a friend of our ministry that was a Chicago cop as well, and he's going, I know the guy. He's bad, bad news. Anyway, <laughs> he put up <laughs> he put up on his website a heretic list. And I'm on the heretic list. <laughs> And he says, if you don't believe what I'm saying, just watch his videos. And I'm going, yeah! He's telling everybody to watch my videos. I think that's pretty cool. But anyway, there there are already families who who have a church split in their own home. And um, I'm just, if, if it's you ladies... Here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to encourage you, ladies. Read, believe, and meditate on 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 tells you, ladies, what to do if your husband doesn't believe. It'll tell you what to do. And I'm, I won't say what's in there. I'll just let God say what God wants to say. All right? But that's what that's for. And it's for you. And if... And if it's you husbands, you men, you're, ser- you're serving to God, you're, you're trying to follow the Lord, you're, in, you're faithful in the Word, uh, you home church with me or whatever, or let's say that your wife goes to one of these churches I preach against, you go along with her, but you're just sitting there going, I can't, this is wrong, this, I can't. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You are to love your wife. You're not to be bitter against her, which is very, very difficult for us as men. You're not to be bitter against her. You're to love her, and you're to regard her as the weaker vessel. Um, Hosea loved Gomer. Go read that. And he went out while she went out and slutted around on him, he went and found her. He was already married to her. He went and found her. She was for sale, and he paid for her again, bought her. That's how much he loved her. And husbands, love your wives that much. Be not bitter against her. 
and regard her as the weaker vessel. And you'd just be, you'd be amazed at the things God will do for you in your marriage. All right? That's just good advice. Let's get back to dealing with what's in our Bible. Is it true or is it not true? And I started on this last week, and I'm going to continue on uh, because I think, it, I, it, to me, it's the most important issue that we're looking at right now. If you, if you remove... If you remove the Bible out of the church, if you remove the inerrant word out of the church, if you take that out, you have to replace it with something. Now, I'm going to be honest, okay? I still wear a suit and tie Sunday morning when I preach. That is tradition. It is, it's a respected tradition. Um, it, is, it looks nice. And there is, there is this concept of how a man's dressed portrays who he is and what he is. And we all know this, okay? We all know this. And a, a, a man in a suit and tie, immediately there is, a, there is a, a, a sudden respect for anybody who shows up on, in any scene wearing a suit and tie. That's just how we are in this in this culture. Can I preach the Word of God without wearing a suit and tie? I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now. If I decided that I just didn't want to wear a suit and tie anymore on Sunday morning, that doesn't mean that we've turned over to a new paradigm and we're liberal and, uh, and you're not going to hear the truth from us. I think 90% of the music that's being flooded into the churches right now has a different spirit in it. Um, we sing out of the hymn book. If I learned some songs somewhere and I felt like they were good songs and we learned them here at Bethel without the hymn book, that doesn't mean that you're not going to hear the truth anymore out of Bethel. You see what I'm saying? But if they take the inerrant word out, there is zero possibility that that church can present the whole truth of God, the whole counsel. It cannot do it. It doesn't have it. And it will be replaced by something else. And so we were looking at this issue of two vines. Deuteronomy 32, for their rock is not as our rock. I'm, I know I talked to them this Thursday. I'm going to run over it very quickly. Their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges, for their vine is the vine of Sodom. In the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Then he says, uh, we, we saw here in Second Kings about the, uh, the wild vine. And the fruit that they found on that wild vine, had it was exactly what God had said here in Deuteronomy 32, that it was full of poison. And they shredded that into the pot, and they started eating, and all of a sudden, they're going, there's death in the pot. We've, there's, we've, just, we've just ate poison. We don't know what to do. And so the man of God, you go read that story, the man of God brought healing to it and, uh, and straightened it all out. And then Jesus talks about in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples." And uh, I'm going to make this as an encouragement to any pastor, preacher listening um, uh, to me today, or you're going to listen to this whenever. Uh, I always, when I go to Arkansas, and I, just a room full of preachers, these are some of my best friends in the world. I'd, I'd love them. I'd hate to, hate to lose any of them because they didn't like something I said. It would, it would really bother me. But the truth of it is, we're us preachers, we're not all right we're not always right. There are issues in every pastor's life 
that are not in accordance with the Word of God. There are no perfect pastors. There are no pastors out there who have it all right from the Word of God. And my strongest encouragement, and in some cases the encouragement sort of gets changed into um, a rebuke, is that not enough of the Word of God is being preached out of pulpits, even King James Bible pulpit pulpits. Not enough of it is being preached. There's a lot of talk about other things. There's a lot of talk about cultural ideas, and this is what we like over here, and this is this is what my mama taught me down here, and and so on. And so, but there's very little word of God given, and I think I think it I, it almost brings to mind this idea that the pastor thinks that it can be done with him and him alone. Now, I learned a long time ago, I have no way in the world within me of changing somebody's mind on something. If God doesn't change a person's mind, if God doesn't change a person's heart, if God doesn't do things in your people, in your church, Pastor, if God doesn't do it, who are you? And I know some guys who are just so arrogant that they think that they are the ones who do everything. I, I, I heard this from the mouth of a, of a youth pastor who was at least five years older than me, and I was about, I don't know, I was about 42, something like that. I'm 48 now. And he was talking about, he was, he was, he was the guy that this whole week at camp, he was the speaker, and he never used a Bible verse in five sermons. He never used a Bible verse, not one, not even halfway quoting one. He talked about the book of Esther, and he told stories about it, but he never said, open your Bibles to the book of Esther, chapter 1. Never said it, never came out of his mouth. And so Tuesday, during the workers' meeting, we're talking about, you know, getting ready to, you know, help young people who come to the altar who want prayer and things like that. And he ch chimed in. He said, especially tonight, because Tuesdays are usually my biggest night. That's usually when the most people come to the altar. And I'm just sitting there listening to this idiot brag about all the camps that he teaches at. And all the things that he does, and he's designed his whole uh, meeting apparatus so that usually on Tuesday, there's a lot of people come down to the altar. And, I, and I've asked this question many times. Do we believe, as born-again Bible-believing Christians, Bible believers, that someone can be saved? And I, I mean truly saved, not what the church calls saved but truly regenerated and born again without the Word of God? The answer is no. But then I ask the question, can we get people to the altar without the Word of God? Absolutely. It happens all the time. There are churches that are so big on altar calls that, I mean, they have an altar call, and boy, that means people just run down to the altar, and I'm not necessarily against that. But I know in some cases it's a show, and it's only a temporary emotional response to something that some man said, but it had nothing to do with the Word of God. Jesus meant what he said, without me ye can do nothing. You want issues, pastor, you want things in your church to change? Give them massive doses of the Word of God. Quit trying to change them. Let God do it. That's his job. You want you want to have revival in your church? Give them the Word of God. You want your church to be right? Give them the Word of God. You want your church to be more involved in outreach or whatever it is? Give them the Word of God and let God do with His church what He wants to do. After all, He owns the sheep. They're His. It's His church. He can do whatever He wants to with it. And that's just my encouragement. And those of you out there listening, you cannot do anything in your life that needs to be done without the Word of God abiding in you. It can't be done. And so this, to me, is, is all important. The, either the, the words of Sodom and the, and the poison of dragons is going to be in you and it's going to kill you, or the Word of God is going to be in you. It's one way or the other. But it's never both at the same time. In 
Titus chapter 1, he talks about there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. This is Hebrew roots. Unruly and vain talkers. Perry Stone, Mark Biltz, Jim Staley, hundreds if not thousands of others who have fallen into the Hebrew roots heresy. That you go back and keep part of the law, and that makes God happier than the pagan, other pagan Christians who believe that the, who stupidly believe the Bible was written in Greek in the New Testament. That's insane. That's what they think. Whose mouths must be stopped? Who subvert whole houses? Teach. See there. You take your family to a church, and they're not as strong as you are, Dad. And they're going to hear stuff in the Sunday school class or in the, in the rock and roll show. They're going to hear stuff, and they're not going to be able to answer it. They subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That's money. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Verse 13, he said, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, that turn from the truth. I want you to focus on this. Meditate on this. And when I say meditate, I don't mean, now you empty your mind now. I mean, think about it. Think about how it works. Think about how God does this thing. or Think about how... Um, False words and, and corrupt Bibles have an effect on people. I told you about that guy that came to me in Fargo. His corrupted translation had such a profound impact on his life and on his thinking. It was like he was incapable of receiving the true word of God. I gave him Bible verses. And every one of them was just like it was a, a tennis ball bouncing against the wall. Just boing! Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. I had a verse pulled up when I, right before I started the show. Uh, yeah, I remember what it is now. Um, let me read a couple of verses here to you so you can understand how this works. Is it okay that I go to a church and they don't use the King James? I'll just give you some scriptures to think about. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's what it says. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Um. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.17, and look this verse up, open your Bible up, make a note of it, print it out, circle it, underline it, whatever. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Already in Paul's day, there were people who were corrupting the word of God. It was already going on right then. By the way, every other translation of the Bible, including the New King James Version, does not have that in there. They've redone it to where it says, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course they do. That's the reason why they started up with all these Bible translations. That's why the Southern Baptist Convention uh, had published and printed the Holman Standard Bible. They got tired of paying Zondervan royalties for using the NIV in all of their literature. And Holman Publishing is a huge publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. This, to say that this company publishes books in, the, in maybe even the millions every year may be dead on. It may even be an understatement. But think about it. As long as they're using Zondervan's NIV verses in their literature, they have to pay a royalty to Zondervan. They have to pay him money. Peddling the word of God for profit. And so Holman, uh, the Southern Baptist said, why don't we just have our own Bible? That way, 
we don't have to pay anybody for it. Well, I would say, why don't you just stick with the King James? You don't have to pay anything for that. It's free. But they said no. So they came out with the Holman Standard Bible. What was the motivation of it? Why did they want this done this way? So they wouldn't have to pay for it anymore. It was their Bible. They owned it. They don't owe anybody a dime on it. And some might even say, well, you know, they were trying to come up with a translation that more fits their doctrine. I want you to think about that one, too, because that's what the Puritans did with the Geneva Bible. The Puritans did that same thing. The Puritans took the Word of God, and they translated it and slanted it so that it would say that kings are evil. We don't obey the king. We don't have to listen to the king. The king is nothing to us. And they even injected into Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against earthly rulers. They injected that phrase into Ephesians 6 in the Geneva Bible. And so if the Holman Publishing Company, if all they were looking for was a Bible that matched their doctrine, maybe I'm pretty sure they've got it, but what do they have? If the King James didn't support their doctrine, you see what they did? Just write another one so it says what we want it to say. This is what Jimmy Swaggart and Donnie Swaggart did with um, 2 Thessalonians 2. They just started injecting all these little things there in the text. And when it, In 2 Thessalonians 2, there should come a falling away first. Now, the original Greek, a better translation of this is that there's going to be a catching away first. And that means the rapture comes before anything else happens. Therefore, we are right because we rewrote the Bible. Now we're right. I'm tell, boy, these people are slick. They're evil, and they are slick. They're subtle. They don't want you to believe the exact words of a King James Bible. They don't want you to believe that. They want you to believe their words first. We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, and it was already going on in Paul's day. Already, false gospels, the, Tom, the gospel of Thomas, not true. Gos Thomas never wrote one. And if he ever did, it's gone. The gospel according to Peter, false book. The Gospel According to Mary Magdalene, false book. Gospel of Judas, false book. Corruptions of epistles and gospel accounts. People getting a hold of copies. Remember, they were making copies of Paul's letters. People were getting, uh, they were securing a copy of, of Paul's letter. They would go through there and read it, and they would say, well, we don't believe that. We don't agree with that. We don't like that. So what would they do? They just make another copy of it, and what, what would they do to it? Take stuff out. Just take it out. Just, we don't like that. Take it out. Doesn't belong there. That wasn't, that wasn't the original. That's not what God intended. And so they took it out. They were already corrupting the Word of God in the days of Paul, in the days of Peter, and by the time John comes around, absolutely. You really have, by the time John uh, it receives the revelation, you've got two growing groups. One is true Christianity, and the other one is a swelling of false doctrines, false epistles, the, the changing or omitting of things in the letters of the apostles being spread around all over. Already it's going, it's going on. So then you get to Constantine in AD 300. He's the emperor of Rome. He's a pagan. He worships the sun god. He worships Venus. And According to myth, legend, history, whatever you want to call it, he sees a sign up in the sky. It wasn't a cross. It was like an ankh or something like that, or the Cairo symbol or something like that, but it wasn't a cross. And he sees that up in the sky. He's in battle, and he sees it up in the sky, and it says, in this sign, conquer. So Constantine perceives now that that is God telling him to become a Christian and conquer the world for God. So that's what he started doing. So he ordered a heretic by the name of Eusebius to prepare 50 New Testaments, 50 Bibles, we have two 
copies of those original 50 to this day. One of them was the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which, uh, this is real funny. Tischendorf found the, the Sinaiticus in a monastery on what the Catholic Church called Mount Sinai. Here's the funny part. That's not Mount Sinai. It's not. They have Mount Sinai, the, the Roman Catholics in their monastery, was in a place in Egypt, not Arabia. Paul said that Sinai was in Arabia, not Egypt. A lot of people think, I tend to agree, a place called Jabal al Laws is the place where Mount Sinai was. It's right on the other side of the Dead Sea. There's a lot of interesting details there. Several people have done expeditions to the place. I think I buy it. Namely, because Paul said it was in Arabia, and that's in Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And so anyway, here's the, here's the Sinaiticus. It's named after a monastery in a place that doesn't match the Bible. It's not Mount Sinai. But the Catholic Church built a monastery there, and that's a holy mountain now. And he finds this, this New Testament in the trash can. Pulls it out. The monks were clearing the house. They were going to throw it away. And this is the 1800s. Pulls it out, looks at it, and says, this is the Greek New Testament. Dating from around the time that Constantine ordered Eusebius to come up with these Bibles. These two documents, the ones that survived, the Sinaiticus and the Vatican one, don't like each other. They disagree with each other in thousands of places. Uh, some of them, I can't remember which one, maybe the Sinaiticus, does not even have the book of Revelation in it. I, and I may be not 100% right on that. It seems like I've read that somewhere. But it wasn't as complete as you might think. And so here these two documents come out. One of them from a monastery in Mount Sinai, one of them, let me refresh my screen, just kind of checking the weather here. One of them, deep within the bowels of the Vatican. And the underground secret Vatican library. And there have only been a handful of people in history that have ever been allowed unfettered access to the entirety of what makes up the Vaticanus document. Not too many people have seen with their own eyes. There are reproductions, photographs, things like that. So here's what, here's what Wes Cotton Hort did. And if you don't know who Wes Cotton Hort are, okay, um, here, let me put this up on the screen here so you can see it. Here's the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, okay? Um, they look pretty pretty good. Look like they're in pretty good shape. Here's why. Nobody touched them. They weren't rolled up and unrolled thousands of times. They were not passed around for other people to see. They were not copied from to any great degree. They were simply just put in these little canisters and they were held there for 1,400 years, something like that. And so, West Cotton Hort, West Cotton Hort were actually hired by the King of England to update the language of the King James Bible, the King's Bible. The King James belongs to the monarchy in England. It's under a royal letters patent. You study that out and you'll learn it's sort of like a copyright, which... When the King James of England had it translated and it was submitted to him, he put it immediately under the royal letters patent, which means nobody can change it. King James knew that factions on both sides, the Church of England and the Puritans, were not happy with how that Bible turned out because it didn't favor one or the other. And King James of England said, well, if I'm the one who commissioned this and they presented it to me and I think that it's dead on to the Word of God, I'm not only by change it, so he put it under the royal letters patent, not in his own name, under the name of the crown. 
so that in perpetuity, as long as there is an, a, a, a king or a queen in England, that royal letter's patent remains in effect. Cannot alter it. So the king of England at that time, late 1800s, can't remember who it was, commissioned Westcott and Hort to update these and thous in the King James. And that's what you heard about the new King James, right? Oh, they just, they just updated. And some of you even heard that about the modern translation. They just updated the, they just took out the these and thous. That, that, that didn't really, that didn't change anything. That's what you were told. You were lied to. Westcott and Hort, once they got a hold of this commission by the king to go and update the Bible, the King's Bible, the one that was going to be read in the Anglican Church, Church of England. Once they got that in their hand, their knowledge that the Tischendorf manuscripts, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, their knowledge that these documents, they believed, here, here's the rule, here's the principle that all the scholars use. The rule is, if it's older, then it must be closer to the original. Because as, the, as I was taught in Bible college, I was taught this. There is a rule that says it's always easier to... How did they, how did they put it? It's always easier to... I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong. It's always easier to add to the Word of God than it is to take away from the Word of God. Therefore, they believe that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, with all these thousands of places taken out, was actually close to the original manuscripts that Paul, Peter, James, and John wrote than the Textus Receptus or the majority manuscript, 5,000 plus manuscripts that all agree pretty much the same thing. And so the idea was is that in the majority text and the Textus Receptus, which is used to, you know, to translate the King James and a lot of other vernacular languages, King James isn't the only one that was translated from this group of manuscripts. The idea was is that people came along and added stuff to those manuscripts because that was easier than taking stuff away. So, and that's their rule. Where does the rule come from? It comes from West Cotton Hort. Where did they get it from, West Cotton Hort? That's where they got it from. They invented it. And now that is the underlying position of practically every Bible college and seminary in this country. There are a few exceptions. When you hear people talk, especially pastors, when you, who have been trained this way, when you hear them talk, and say, look, the King James, I believe, was translated right. This man is going to counter with, yes, but the King James translators did not have access to the best and earliest manuscripts. Yeah, they did. They had access to the Vaticanus, and they wouldn't touch it. Didn't want anything to do with it. But see, all that is a side issue. Whether you know this or not, you don't need it. You don't need it to win an argument. You know what you need? Bible verses. Give them Bible verses. Tell them why you believe what you believe. That's why I'm going through this. When you, when you finally see what I'm going to do Saturday, there will be no doubt left in your mind whatsoever. Zero doubt left in your mind. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's these two documents. That's, where, that's what underlies all of the modern translations. From these manuscripts, the Latin Vulgate, AD 600, is the only Bible allowed for nearly a thousand years. Here's what the Latin Vulgate looks like. Good luck with that. Good luck with reading and understanding that. You can't. So the Catholic priests all over the world would get up and they would read this and say, this is the Holy Scriptures. And you'd say, I have no idea what he said. Shh, shh, that's the word of God. Shh, don't say anything. Shh, mm -mm, mm -mm. just trust the priest. He'll tell you. He won't lie to you. He'll tell you what's right. Meanwhile, 
I like this part. Copies were being made in the early church in Greek. And yes, some in Hebrew, some in Syriac, the Peshitta. But you had copies being made in Greek all over wherever Paul and all the apostles preached. And they were passing letters around. Paul's letter, Paul, and uh, there's a place here, let me see here. In, uh, let me get to it. Uh, I've used it before. Paul told, the, he was to the Colossians, his letter to the Colossians, he said, make sure that you read this letter at the Laodicean church, and the, the letter I wrote to the Laodicean church, make sure it gets over here and it's read here. So what, what happened? They would copy the letters and send them between the churches. And of that, you have over 5,000 complete or partial manuscripts that exist to this day. And let me, let me say this again. The original manuscript that Paul wrote on, or his amanuensis, his secretary wrote on, and in case you don't know that, Paul said he ended the book of Galatians with, see with what, what large letter I write with my own hand. There was a man that usually would help Paul write these things out, probably because of his eyes, which he admits to in the book of Galatians. But anyway, um, there are none of those originals anywhere to be found. Maybe the Vatican has them. Maybe, maybe the Vatican has every one of them and won't let anybody see them. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. Would not shock me in the least bit. But the truth of it is, there isn't a single scholar or university in the world anywhere that has access to the original manuscripts. And so, when these people say, we believe, this is our church faith statement, and it sounds spiritual, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is inerrant in everything that it says in the original manuscripts. What they're telling you is, we believe the Bible disappeared. The real Word of God that had no mistakes in it doesn't exist. You know what they're trying to tell you? That God allowed His Holy One to see corruption. I, I will, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to explain it like this. This is something I'm working on for Saturday, okay? Adam, the, you know, the guy that God created in the Garden of Eden. Adam's dead. Does anybody know where Adam's dead body is? Does anybody know? No, huh? There's no, there is no, there is no cave, cemetery, ossuary, nothing. There's no mausoleum, nowhere in the world where Adam's body is buried. When God created Adam and formed him out of the dust of the ground, we all know this, God gave Adam a book. That book was his DNA, his genetic code. That book, that DNA determined Adam's hair color, his physique, was he a short man, was he a tall man, was he a fat man, was he a skinny man? Did he like apples and not oranges? What was it about it? Okay. Um, did he have little beady eyes or did he have big eyes or did he blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever? We don't, we have no idea. We have no idea whatsoever. We could not go to Adam's body and extract his DNA from it and have a perfect image of who Adam is. Now, I want you to think about this, because God said in Isaiah 40, all flesh is grass, okay? God, I like this. And remember, when they wrote out the original manuscripts, it was either on, on vellum, which is flesh, animal skin, or papyrus, which is grass. And just as Adam's body, his flesh, his physical body, 
has perished and it's gone, so too are the original manuscripts. Well, you would ask yourself the question, well, how then could we know what the Bible said because we don't have the originals? That's, that's what I said. That was, when I was in my NIV days, I used that argument against King James people. I would say, look, don't even try that with me. I know for a fact we don't have any original manuscripts, and there is no way in the world that I could compare my King James or my NIV to find out which one is right because I don't have the originals. And I use that against people. And I know how they talk. I know how they think because that's what I thought. That's what, how I talked. That's how I was able to maybe get a, a stronghold in people's lives or their minds. That's how I could win the argument. But here's something to think about. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 5 that before Adam died, he made a copy of his DNA and left it. He's saying, all right, you got me. Genesis chapter 5, turn there. Man, I like this. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genes of Adam. (laughs) Isn't that cool? This is the book of the generations of Adam. The book. In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there was none of them. In thy book. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. When God fashioned Adam, it was according to his word. And him, Jesus Christ. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. By the way, verse 2 does not say that Adam was created a male and female. It does not say that. Male and female created he them. What it does mean, what it could mean is that when God created Adam, God created Adam that in his genetics was the potential of any child proceeding from his bowels had the ability to either be a female or a male. One of the two. But it does not say that God created Adam a male and a female. That's an abomination. That's false doctrine. That's a setup doctrine. All right? Because then it says, then you would say, well, that was in God's image, so God must be a male and a female together in the same body. That's Baphomet, people. That's what that is. That's the God that's male and female together. By the way, that's Jim Staley's God, too, because he uses the, the Sephiroth, the tree of life from the Kabbalah, and it talks about God the Father and the Holy Spirit Shekinah woman joining together and creating baby Jesus. That's, that's, nah, that's wicked. Man and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam and, and in the day when they were created. Now look at verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his what? Own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Before Adam died, he made a copy of his DNA. In the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years and begat sons and daughters. By the way, he, be, he made multiple copies of his DNA. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So what happened to his body? Turned to dust. Doesn't exist anywhere, anymore, anywhere on the planet. You'll never find Adam's body. But before he died, he made a copy, made hundreds of copies probably, of his DNA. And so did Seth. And so did Enos. You go all the way down to Noah. Noah made three copies of it, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then they were the uh, forefathers, the progenitors in Genesis chapter 10 of every family and tribe on the planet right now. Everybody in the world comes from Shem, Ham, or Japheth, which comes from Noah, which came from Seth, which came from Adam. So here's what you could do. If you wanted to find out what Adam looked like, what color hair he had, was he tall, short, skinny, fat, what did, how, did he like, does he like classical music, does he like jazz, or whatever. 
if they wanted to find the genetic makeup, the exact genetic DNA of Adam, here's what you could do. You could get a sample of DNA from everybody on the planet alive right now. Bring all of those samples together. Filter out what is a duplicate. Okay? And by that I mean two guys with brown hair. Okay? You filter that out. Okay? And after you've taken out all the duplications, you have a piece of Adam's DNA in your DNA. And if you collected enough samples from around the world, enough unique pieces, and put them all together, you would have the perfect copy of Adam's DNA. Now, I want you to ponder this. Because we know that before Noah got on the ark, all flesh was in the process of corrupting itself. And we know, according to the scriptures in Genesis 6, that Noah was perfect in his genetics, in his generations. Which means that the very word of God, the book that God wrote in Adam, was passed down to Noah and was intact as he passed it down to his three sons. And they passed it down to their multitude of sons. And they passed it down. We have it right now. There is existing on this planet right now the exact genetic structure of the first man, Adam. Think about it. God, we we are not genetically different from what Adam was. We are still the exact same species of, I'll say homo, that means man, okay? We are homo sapien, which means we have sapient thoughts. We have self-awareness, okay? We are the exact same species that Adam was. No changes or alterations in the DNA whatsoever. And existing on this world right now is the exact DNA of Adam. It may be scattered all over the 72 tribes, but the truth of it is, it's still here and it's still intact. So you try to tell me that God wrote a book, gave it to several of men throughout the Bible age, and allowed it to become corrupt, and there isn't, there is not anywhere on this earth a perfect word of God. You're lying through your teeth. Nature itself doesn't even act that way. The very DNA that the very first giraffe ever had when God created it, that DNA still exists today. The very first horse, the very first chicken, Okay, the very first egg, for those of you who believe the egg came first. The very first, whatever species it was, that DNA still exists on this planet today. It was passed down from generation to generation. That's what happened with the Bible. In the Old Testament, every generation of Levite priests, scribes, were responsible for making sure and maintaining the accuracy of the Word of God. In the church age, likewise, the priesthood of the believer was given the responsibility of making sure that every word of God remained pure. And when you have the majority text, you have 5,000 plus manuscripts, partial manuscripts, complete manuscripts. When you put them all together and begin to compare them, all of a sudden now you get a complete and accurate record of the original manuscripts, just like the DNA of Adam still exists in this world to this very day. I'm going to talk about that Sunday. It's, it's, it's amazing. Okay? Oh, I love this. Then, around A.D. 150, you had these manuscripts being translated. Now watch this. Watch this. You're going to like this one. 
Here's the equivalent of Bibles being translated into other languages. Go back to Genesis 10. In Genesis 10, you have Noah, one man, handing down uh, in his likeness and in his image to three sons who look like their father. As those bloodlines begin to disperse through Ham, Shem, and Japheth, little things start changing. The, the progeny of Ham, all of a sudden now the skin tone is dark. The hair is different. They like different food. They eat goats. I don't like it. I don't know if I like goat or not. Never had it. Like lamb, it's okay. I just don't throw a lot of lamb on my barbecue grill, all right? But anyway, you, you understand what I'm saying is that when you get to Genesis 10, you start seeing differences in how God divided up the tribes on the earth by families, by genetic appearance, things like that, and they start dispersing. And then all of a sudden now they're all sprecking a different language. And then all of a sudden, God divides the world in half, and half of them are on one side, and half of them are on the other. And God is the one who did that. And so you have that. You have the, you have the word of God given to the apostles in the early church. And that word of God is copied, and manuscripts are being passed around. But then the word of God does what the word of God does. I mean, people are starting to be saved who don't speak Greek. You have people who have a love for their own countrymen, and they want to carry this amazing word of God, the letters of Paul or the gospel of Mark or whatever. They want to carry this amazing thing over to their own people, but their own people don't understand Greek. So what do they start doing? You have men, listen to this now. This old, uh, The guy who wrote the email, this might help you. God was giving some of these men the gift of interpretation of unknown tongues. They start copying the Word of God into the Syriac language, which is the Peshitta, into the old Latin Bible, not the Vulgate of the Catholic Church, but one that was before that, one called the Italic Bible. Is it because it was all in Italics? No, it was, it was one in Italy, Italian, early Italian. The Gothic Bible. A man by the name of Ulfilas wanted to preach the gospel to his people, the Goths. So he sat down and went to work on translating the Word of God into the Gothic language. Gail Ripplinger has a, has a really interesting book on this. Let me show you some uh, graphics here. I can't remember what the name of the book is, but I, I got a copy. It's just it's pretty cool. This is the, the Peshitta here. Um, here is the, um, uh, I can't remember what this one is. Oh, this is the part of the Gothic Bible. And here's what, here's what Gail found. Now, I've talked to Gail several times, and I haven't talked to her in a while, but um, I appreciate the work she does. She went and found an old Gothic translation. And she started looking at it and examining it. And first of all, she noticed that there was a similarity. You could see the roots of English in the Gothic language, okay? And, and I'll show you some more of that. Anyway, in Ephesians 3.14, Paul said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have the Frausians unsar Jesus Christus. That's Jesus Christ, okay? Lord of our Jesus Christ. That is omitted in the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. That passage right here is omitted in the two false documents, the vine of Sodom. That passage was preserved as Ulfilas translated the word into Gothic. It was there. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. And there it is. It's in 1 Corinthians 16, 22 in the Gothic Bible. It was omitted in the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The word Christau has been omitted, or Christ has been omitted in the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. 
And it says in the, in the translations, like the NIV, I can do all things through him which strengtheneth me. Him who? Who's the him that strengthens you? The word of God correctly identifies it as Christ. Eusebius, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, men of corrupt minds, already corrupting the word of God. They took it out. It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Ak be al word goods. You see that? You can see the, the roots of English words in Gothic. And it literally says, but by every word of God. That's Luke 4.4. 4. That's omitted. That's omitted. Let me, let me look at it. I, um, I still got my cheater Bible here. Let me look up um, in Luke 4.4. 4. This is the interlinear Greek New Testament with the uh, New American Standard Bible. Luke chapter 4. Verse 4, and it takes a while to get to it because it's got like three things in here on every page. Luke chapter 4, i got to lick my fingers, and there it is right here. Here we go. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, in the King James it is written, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now remember, this is what Jesus is saying against the devil who's trying to tempt him in the wilderness. All right? Let me read the New American Standard, which is the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek. That's what everybody says. What, what do you Bible use? I use the New American Standard because it's the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek. I've heard that a thousand times if I heard it one time. Where did they get that from? Here's what the New American Standard says in, in Luke 4.4. 4. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And then it stops right there. And then it goes on to verse 5. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now I will tell you, verse 5 in the New American Standard sounds a lot like the King James rendering of that same verse. But you go back to verse 4. You have a big gaping hole in your Bible. In the, in the Greek, what Greek did they use here in this one? There's several versions. There's the Nessel Aland uh, Greek text. This is the what? Reverend, let's see here, Greek text. I don't know what they call this one. I don't know if it's the Nessel Aland Greek text or there's another one, and I can't remember which one it was. Let's see here. I don't, I, you know, I'll find it one of these days. Anyway, right here in verse 4, um, let's see here. To him it, it has been written, Geg graptai hoti uk ep arto. Arto is bread. Um, mono only. Zesetai shall live whole anthropos. Okay, is man. Literally, it would if you were just reading word to word, it has been written, not on bread only shall live man. It's because Greek didn't have a word order. That had they changed that how they wrote the word, and that gave it the part of speech, the part of the sentence. But they have omitted here. In fact, in here they didn't even put a note down at the bottom saying the earliest and best manuscripts do not have their last of this verse. They took it out. And every modern Bible reader who favors the other translations says that should have never been in the Bible. Here's what, here's what the, the guy told me last week. He's telling me that when Jesus said, it is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That man was telling me that the King James translators added to the word of God, added that to the word of God. They added it. Thus, they're in violation. Here's my problem with that. This is word for word exactly what is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. We covered that last week, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Jesus was quoting scriptures, and they're wanting us to believe that the newer translations are more accurate 
because of the Greek manuscripts that they use. But the Greek manuscripts they use don't even agree with the Old Testament. That's what they're trying to tell you. But the Gothic Bible, Ophelus, he had it in there. He had it right. Man should not live by bread alone, but ach be our goods, but by every word of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Romans 16, 24. There it is. Jesus Christos mid, which is with. Amin Iswarama. Sounds like Obama's mama, Iswarama. Amen. That's omitted in the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. The scripture was fulfilled, which saith he was numbered with the transgressors. Ophelus put it in there. It's Mark 15, 28. Ya us fulnoda data gimalido data kidano ya mid, which means with. Unsibagayim ranizvas. Pardon my Gothic. He was numbered with the transgressors. That verse, Mark 15, 28. In fact, let me look it up here. Let me look it up here. Mark 15. Oh, look here. Turn right to it. Mark 15, 28. Yeah. They have here in the New American Standard, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Okay, but they have it in parentheses. They have it in brackets. Okay, let me see if I can show this to you so you can see what that. Let me do this and do that. Okay, see, I've got it highlighted in yellow. Okay, you see that? They've got it in brackets. There you go. And the scriptures was fulfilled, which uh, which says, and he was number with the church. See the brackets there? You go down to the bottom here, and I'll read to you what that says in case you couldn't see it. It says, many manuscripts do not contain this verse. Really? How, how many of them? How many of them do not contain that verse? And so what if they don't? They're wrong. He was, and let me see, look in the Greek here. Okay, in the Greek, in the Greek interlinear part, they go from verse 27 to verse 29. They, they omit verse 28. They don't even put it in the Greek text. He was numbered with the transgressors. That was a fulfillment of Scripture. Mark didn't leave it out. He put it in there. Um, Westcott and Hort, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, they took it out. Ophelus knew it belonged in there, and he gave that to his Gothic people and said, this is the word of God. He was numbered with the transgressors. And he said unto them, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. That is Mark 9, 29. Let's, let's do this. I'm in Mark. I'm going to go to Mark 9. It's going to take me a little while. I've got to turn a lot of pages. There's a lot of stuff on here. Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Yeah, here we go. Here's the New American Standard. In verse 29, he said, and he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. And the New American Standard is the most literal to the Greek and the Hebrew. And in the Greek text, um, I'm going to give you the literal word-for-word -word transliteration. And he told them, this kind by nothing can to come out except by prayer. They took out fasting. Look look here. Look here. See the word fast here? Bidai ya fastamnya. Prayer and fasting. That was in the Gothic Bible. An early translation of the Word of God, which means that the Greek text that Ophelus was using had those words in it in Greek. He left it in the Roman Catholic Constantine and Eusebius and whoever else took it out, omitted it. They didn't like it. What spirit, what spirit do you think works in a man to cause him to remove the exact formula for overpowering devils? What spirit? Does God's Holy Spirit do that? No. 
the devil does that. He does not want people to know how, to, how people can have power over him and overcome him. When you are just praying and devils won't leave you alone, then you start starving yourself. I guarantee you this kind will go out by prayer and fasting. That's what God said. In fact, he said it twice. And in the other place, can't remember where it is, in the other place in the scriptures, this verse doesn't even exist. It took it out. Now, and we're about out of time here, and I want to look at some emails, but along with this testimony of over 86,000 early church citations in the writings, epistles, prayer books, pulpit books, lectionaries, let me explain that a little bit. We all know that when preachers showed up to preach on the Lord's Day, back in those days, they didn't come carrying a big King James Bible in their hand. They didn't have that. What they had was rolled up scrolls. They even probably had a rudimentary form of, of books, like you and I have bound books, all right? But they could not carry into the church service the entirety of the Word of God, which they had at that time. It, just, it was the manuscripts and the rolls and the scrolls just too big. So here's what they would do as the minister would prepare for the service. He would, he would take the scriptures that he was going to use, like I do. Um, let's see here. If you want to know what my notes look like while I'm preaching, they look like that. One verse of scripture after another. Just let the scripture preach the message. And so that's what they would do. They would copy them out of the manuscripts they had had and write them in their prayer books or their pulpit books, their lectionaries, which were books that were meant to be on a pulpit as the minister was going over the Word of God. And so there are thousands of those still around. Over 86,000 letters that men were writing back and forth to one another, quoting scriptures, quoting the Word of God. The um, 1 John 5, 7. I'll, I'll tell you a piece of true information. Um, whenever you try to show somebody 1 John 5, 7 and say, see, that's missing out of your Bibles, they might know this little fact. This little fact is the earliest manuscript that we have with 1 John 5, 7 in it, in, in it dates back to 1000 A.D., 900 plus years after John wrote his first epistle. In every manuscript of 1 John that we have before 1000 A.D., 1 John 5, 7 is missing. Now, that's something that these guys are going to tell you. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to convince you that a thousand years after John, someone added that verse to the Scriptures and thus violated the Word of God of adding to or taking away. Not so fast. There was an early Christian-esque writer by the name of Cyprian. At about the same time as Eusebius took all these corrupted manuscripts and made his 50 Bibles for the Roman pontiff, Constantine. And in one of, I have a good friend who is, I mean, he is a scholar scholar. He and I went to Bible college together. Uh, we became very, very good friends. We had a lot of things in common, had a lot of things not in common, but we were good friends, still remain to this day. He took a different path. Um, he continued on in college. He went and got his master's degree, and, and now he has a doctorate. His, his forte is scholarship and, and Christian education. He is a principal right now of a pretty good-sized Christian school in, in the Tulsa area. And he called me one day, and he said, Mike, he said, the uh, Free Will Baptists want me to write their, the commentary for First John. I said, oh, cool. And he said, you know me, he said, um, I, I like the King James, and he said, I think it's right. And this guy, let me tell you, if there's anybody who could read Greek and Hebrew, it's him. 
He's just, he, that's just who he is. He's a scholar, scholar. So here's what he, he's asking me. He said, I think 1 John 5, 7 is what John wrote. I think it should be in there. I think that it had, there are manuscripts that don't have it in there. Someone took it out because they didn't believe it. And he said, I think the manuscript in AD 1000 is accurate, and that should be in there. And it represented a previous manuscript that we don't have access to, we don't have a copy of it. But he said, my problem is, the truth is, the earliest manuscript that we have dates back to 1000 AD. And a lot of people believe it shouldn't be there. And I just had, I think I read it from Gail Ripplinger. I said, there's a church writer by the name of Cyprian. And he said, hang on a minute. And I can hear him turn around, and he's got a copy of Cyprian in his library. I mean, this is the... And he said, I'll look that up. But Cyprian quoted 1 John 5, 7 almost word for word. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So you have evidence like that of these missing verses and missing phrases out of all these new translations. You have substantial amounts of evidence that every one of these are accounted for, either in the 5,000-plus manuscript copies of the Greek New Testament or these citations or these prayer books or these lectionaries, you have an accurate... It's just like finding Adam's genetics. You sample enough people on this planet, you're going to get every single gene that Adam had in his flesh. You're going to get every one of them. And that's ignored. They don't want to admit that. They don't want that. But underlying all of this, and if, and if this really is not really your, your thing, you just don't get into all the manuscript stuff and stuff like that. What I'm trying to do is just show you that this stuff can be believed. And the King James can be right. Scientifically, it can be right you still have the evidence of the written Word of God itself in your King James that says every Word of God is pure. Every Word of God is pure. Wayne, Brother Wayne, who uh, came and preached for me while I was in um, Fargo, says this teaching goes great with Isaiah 34. Let me turn to Isaiah 34 very quickly. You turn there as well. We're going to try to do this before the music starts. Isaiah 34, 16. I think I know what this says. The Bible says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Look at that. Way to go, Wayne. His mouth commanded it, and his spirit gathered them. All of the copies of the manuscripts that exist all over the world all gathered together and accumulated into one book and translated for us. And, ha and he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Amen, Brother Wayne. Appreciate that. That's, that's good. I like that. I'm going to use that. Um, pure Bible study tomorrow, tomorrow night, Wednesday night service. Uh, Thursday, we'll be on the road headed to Harrison, Arkansas. Saturday, I can't wait. I'll ask you a question, something you can ponder. You can even look it up if you want. I, I'm a diabetic, so I have issues with insulin. Insulin is something that my body needs to um, deliver sugar to all the cells in the body and to keep the blood sugar levels down in my in my blood. How does my body make insulin? How does the genetic coding in a strand of DNA, how does that little code book, like a Bible, how does that get turned into insulin? You're going to like it. I promise you, you're going to like it, all right? 
Love you. We'll see you uh, live service tomorrow night. God bless you. It's been fun today. Let me hit this and this and this. All right, see ya.